On December 10th, the Bureau for Labor Statistics reported that in the United States, consumer prices increased 6.8% year over year. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have Jeff Snyder, the head of global research for Alhambra Partners, on the line with me. And I assume that, Jeff, you're going to admit that we are in an inflationary hellstorm and that you, well, that's what people are expecting you to say, right? That we are in one of these things. But guess what, ladies and gentlemen, if you've been watching the show, you know that Jeff is going to work his way out of this box. He's the Harry Houdini of macroeconomics. 6.8% increase year over year in consumer prices. How's he going to get out of this one and end his article by saying many people won't want to believe it. But yes, even this epic CPI high and all its related data actually fit the profile of a disinflationary, deflationary outlook. Harry Houdini. Yeah, and I, you know, Emil, it's it starts with the fact that I this is not inflation. People think that I'm saying that consumer prices are not rising, or that I'm trying to get into some kind of argument about semantics. If I don't call it inflation, that lets me off the hook for CPIs that are the highest in 40 years, right? And that's not what we're saying. We're saying yes, consumer prices have gone up, and that consumer prices, at least according to the CPI, have gone up the most over the last year than at any other point in the last four decades. It's going back before anybody knew Alan Greenspan's name, which I believe I wrote in that article, which was, was such a wonderful thing when people didn't know Alan Greenspan or the Federal Reserve Chairman's name. But I digress. So I'm not making a semantical argument that this is an inflation that somehow lets me off the hook. What I'm saying is that there's not a monetary reason for consumer prices to have risen. And because there isn't a monetary reason, this isn't inflation. Consumer prices are being driven by something else. And we also know from the monetary system in the fixed income markets that because it's been the consumer prices are being driven by something else, when we say it's not going to last, that also has a very particular meaning. How does that end? And it doesn't usually end well, especially when we see embedded within these consumer price index increases the main component being oil or actually gasoline prices. So all of the ingredients, it's not, you know, it's not semantics. It's not inflation versus quote unquote inflation. It is some kind of trick to pull, you know, pull the wool over people's eyes and say, oh, well, I'm really wrong, but I'm, I'm actually going to try to pretend I'm right. It's about understanding causes and effects so that we can understand what we should expect in the future. You know, why is the bond market so pessimistic with CPI so high? Why are inflation expectations in the bond market so low and going lower over the past six weeks, despite the fact that CPIs are the highest in 40 years? There's a reason for it, and it's not some mind trick. There's actual legitimate macroeconomic substance to the argument that we're making. I want to do a quick digression. Inflation expectations. You just mentioned the bond market. There are other inflation expectations by professional economic forecasters. Well, we don't think very highly of those forecasts. Other people do. Orthodox economics does. But then there's also the household surveys, Jeff. And so we did have some, by the Michigan consumer, uh, you know, inflation expectation for the year ahead. They didn't change month to month, right? They're still at 4.9% year to year, or one year ahead and 3% for the next five years. They didn't change with the latest readings, the preliminary readings, which just came out. We did have in the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, those inflation expectations did increase from the previous month for November. They're now up to 6% for the year ahead. So you mentioned inflation expectations in the bond market. You're emphasizing those, but you're not emphasizing household expectations. Why? No, it's not that I'm not emphasizing. I just haven't got to them. And, and okay. I would actually overemphasize the household expectations because what they're actually telling us is the same thing the bond market is. Households do not expect consumer prices to remain at these levels for very long, as you just referenced. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, University of Michigan survey. Yeah, yes, it's, less, it's about 5% in the one year four, but only 3% in the five year. And 3% is less than the five year expectation had been in 2014 and before. So even households are saying, on average, yeah, we think consumer prices are going to be high, but eventually they're going to return to where they had been over the last you know, couple of years. So that's not inflation either. That's households saying we, we're paying more at the gasoline pump, we're paying more for groceries, 
but we don't think it's going to last. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York survey, same type of thing. Their numbers are higher, but they're also upside down too. The one-year inflation rate is above 6% Six, yeah. because people match their, their perceptions with what they're paying at the pump and what the CPIs are and things like that. But there's three-year inflation expectation, I believe, is only 4% or a little bit less than 4%, which means, again, households, consumers are expecting whatever the CPIs are now, they're going to be significantly, substantially less in the future, which is the exact same expectation the bond market is showing, which is, yes, CPIs are high. But it's not because of money. It's not because this is going to be like the 1970s. There are other reasons for that. And those other reasons, by the way, are usually harmful to the economy over the intermediate term. And that, of course, by that we mean oil shock. Anytime we ever see historically outside of something like the 1970s, you get an oil shock where gasoline prices and fuel prices in general or energy, energy prices across the board go up, it's harmful to the economy. It's deflationary over the intermediate term because it robs the economy of substantial vitality that it just cannot overcome that drag because there isn't this overwhelming flow of currency throughout the entire system to maintain the price spiral. Without that money, it becomes a negative inflation factor. We're going to talk about gasoline and how it's powering these inflation numbers. I just wanted to go back quickly to the Michigan survey, University of Michigan, and just point out that the year ahead forecast did have a step up in May. But since May and through December, during this time period when we've been recording these highest ever in many decades or generations, CPI changes, we've essentially been unchanged in household expectations. They've gone from 4.6% in May to 4.9% for the year ahead, despite these incredible increases. For the five year ahead, there has been no trick. There has been no trickle up. It's just been at three percent from May through December. Uh, it's sort of stepped up in May from like two point seven to three yeah, percent. But, not but much, essentially, right? not, yeah. not. They're not being convinced. It's not accelerating like we are seeing in the actual CPI. We saw a step up and then stability since May all the way through December's reading. All right. And it's it's weird. Gasoline. It's actually eerie how that how closely that matches the longer run bond market inflation expectations. You look at the five year, five year forward rate, for example, it is almost exactly how you describe it of the University of Michigan's five year forward inflation expectation, where it didn't really rise all that much from 2020 lows. We're still way less than we were. At least the expectation is the long run inflation expectation of the bond market is much less than it was you know, five, six, seven years ago, never really got all that high to begin with. And it didn't really change over the last six months. So it's inconsistent, you know, consumers, bond market, they're all inconsistent with the idea that this is inflation. Yes, consumer prices have gone up, but neither consumers nor bond traders believe, and bond traders, by the way, are not just bond traders, they're the actual monetary system. Everybody seems to get the picture outside of the mainstream media anyway, that this is not something that's going to last. Jeff, did I tell everyone that the article we're working off of is the higher the CPI, the less for inflation posted on the 10th of December at Alhambra Investments? I don't remember if I did, but in that article, there's a quote and you say, what is the deal with consumer prices? Given a single word to describe it, gasoline. And then you've got two graphs immediately after that, which the audience can see right now, which shows CPI, just the headline number, and then CPI energy. And you can see how they're, I couldn't tell you which one is which, right? They look identical. And then the next graph right below that, we segue from CPI energy to CPI motor fuel. It's a little bit more pronounced, the motor fuel, but we can see a correlation. And Jeff, are you saying then causation? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I think everybody knows that the, the biggest component of however you want to term it, consumer price increases, acceleration, whatever you want to call it. Everybody knows it's, it's gasoline prices. Everybody knows that when they go to fill up their vehicles, they're paying a hell of a lot more than they were a year ago or even just six months ago. So they can feel the consumer price increases and they know that a big, big healthy chunk of it or big unhealthy chunk of it is due to that factor primarily. We've got three more graphs coming up and they all show the same measures. They're all going to show all other prices, and then we're, what we're looking at right now are CPI contributions year over year for the last several months going all the way back to the 
to January of 2021. And so we're looking at all other prices, and then we're looking at two specific categories. Cars, which you've broken down into new vehicles and used cars and trucks. And then our second category is energy, which is other energy, energy services, and gasoline. And what you do with each of these three graphs is you, you put each of these categories, other energy and vehicles on the bottom, so we can sort of better appreciate the, the difference, the, the increase, the component, the, the oomph be, 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 uh, behind each of these categories. And the first one you show us is energy. And so we see a big, big surge, Jeff, in uh, the most recent reading, November. November in particular, right? I mean, energy, mm -hmm. going back to around uh, March and April, yep. has become a, more, a higher and higher component of these annual increases in the CPI, which makes sense because that's when oil prices really started to rebound and then stay higher. And, and the people probably started to notice that they were paying more at the gasoline pump for filling up their vehicles. But it really made a huge contribution in November, even more so than it had at any point up until this month or, the, or up until last month. So energy prices, or at least gasoline prices, according to the CPI bucket, really spiked in November. It really had an impact at least November compared to any other month during the, the, this quote unquote inflationary period. So that was one big, big reason why the CPI had accelerated, even from where it had been the middle part of this year, you know, uh, from June, July, and August, and even September to a little bit, where it had been around 5% to a little bit higher, now up to almost 7%. Most of that increase was just gasoline prices. Now we're looking at vehicles. You put vehicles on the bottom so we can track it more easily. And again, we see November a substantial increase in vehicle-related prices. What can we learn from this graph? Well, what we can learn is for the two of those segments together, those two specific parts of the CPI bucket, cars and energy, made up 58% of the 6.8% annual rate increase. So those two segments alone accounted for, you know, what almost two thirds of the increase. And so, you know, when you show the one graph where the all other prices are on the bottom, you can clearly see that the prices of everything else in the consumer bucket if we took away energy and cars, which I know you can't do, but if you took away those two segments, the inflation rate, the CPI rate over uh, November 2021 versus November 20 would have been less than 3%. And not only that, it has decelerated over the last couple months. So it's really most of the emphasis in the CPI, most of the acceleration in the annual rate of the CPI over the last couple months has been those two things alone. And the key is, Jeff, as you make... Often make the point often in your writing. I'm struggling, aren't I, Jeff? Uh, really. I should tell people I it's, haven't it's, had you know, my sherry this morning. My Christmas. You know what it is, Emil, it's, Whenever we talk about inflation, it, it it should be really easy, as we talked about in the last segment. This should be, hey, is the is there too much money? Or is there not too much money? What's really what we should be talking about? But because we can't really talk about it, or at least the mainstream media or the mainstream, you know, the way the public is told to think about inflation, we can't really think about these things or discuss them in any sort of straightforward fashion. And on top of that, inflation is an extremely emotional issue, as we've said time and time again, and understandably so, because if you're paying more money at the pump, you're paying more at the grocery store, you're not making any more money from your job, you are substantially worse off for what has happened. Now, we're not denying that that's the case. What we're trying to do is help people understand why. Why are you substantially worse off? Why are you paying more at the pump? Why are you paying more at the grocery store or any place else or at the used car lot or the new car lot? Because we want people to know to identify the real factors at work here so that we can figure these things out. If we just blame the Fed nakedly and think, oh, QE, money printing, bank reserves, that's counterproductive because we're chasing something that isn't real. So we're trying to get people to understand. We understand that consumer prices have gone up and that has created a significant hardship on most people. But we need to understand why that is. And when we look at the CPI this way, we're not trying to say, oh, we were wrong about inflation. Inflation actually happened. What we're trying to say is that, no, exactly what we, we told you was going to happen has happened, which is consumer prices are being squeezed by a supply shock, not because of money printing. And the supply shock is most evident and most visible in two places. This just so happened to be the same two places that have contributed the most to the CPI increases. We know for a fact that companies are not producing a satisfactory enough number of vehicles, which has meant most people in lieu of being able to buy a new car 
have been flooding the used car lots and paying any price for a used vehicle. And the other thing is energy. We know for a fact, not just in the United States, but around the world, that energy producers have quite intentionally kept the supply of crude and other energy products, distillations and things like that, they've kept them purposefully low. So in these two major components of the CPI increases, we easily find supply reasons for them, not money reasons. And so again, what we're really doing here is trying to sort out for you, as the bond market has already done, it's not inflation as a semantics argument, it's this is inflation or it's not inflation. It's not inflation, then consumer prices are being driven by supply factors. As you just said, right in the article, quote, why so much pain from mostly these narrow slices, supply, 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 you said, and we just showed those two graphs sh showing the supply reduction in assemblies and industrial production in the mining, quarrying, oil sector. There's one other sec there's one other solution to this, right? If it's not the Federal Reserve that's creating too much money and therefore causing this inflation, maybe it is the federal government giving away too much stimulus and destroying the currency. And perhaps that was the case, but then we've got these two graphs that you show us, Jeff, one about the CPI core and then the next one, CPI services. And now we're seeing the third camel hump. The first two camel humps were associated with the, the helicopter payments, but those are waning now. So we shouldn't blame current increases in consumer goods on what the Federal Reserve, uh, federal government did in January, March, and April, right? Yeah, but they still show up. You're right. The, but they still show up in the annual rate of increases, right? Because we're comparing prices in November of 2021 to prices in November of 2020. In between that year are those the second larger camel hump, as you described. And that's a really good point, Emil, because the third factor, which, which has made the consumer price, the annual rates of change in consumer price index is so high, is the what happened to all prices, especially in April, May, June, that, that time period. After the second helicopter was delivered, Americans in particular went absolutely crazy spending on goods at a time when supply was constrained almost universally across the board. So we had the greatest imbalance between demand and supply during those particular months. And that's where you see the heaviest influence or the camel hump that you call it across a broad swath of consumer prices. But as you also point out, since then, since around May, June, that camel hump has started to decline, especially the further you get away from goods, the further you get away from used and used cars, as well as energy, you see less and less and less acceleration or even increases in something like services, for example. And the services, people might remember, we are a service-oriented economy. And so services is some niche small part of the global economy. It's in a tremendous part, and we see almost no inflation, no consumer price acceleration whatsoever outside of those narrow segments. So it all adds up to these three things. We have a supply shock in those three ways, which is energy prices, used and new vehicle prices, and then the Uncle Sam helicopter from earlier in the year. That's where the consumer price increases have come from. And even as high as the CPI got in November, it's still those three things. It's not money printing, it's not inflation, it's supply shock. That's it for me, Jeff, for this particular episode. Ladies and gentlemen, you can go to Alhambra Investments. The higher the CPI, the less for inflation, December 10th. Jeff, are you ready to move on to part 3C? Or is there anything else we need to tell the audience before we go? The only other part we should reiterate and highlight is that when we, again, gasoline prices, oil price supply shock, is not usually good for the economy over the intermediate run. So yes, you get the consumer prices that accelerate, but usually they, they come down very quickly because it normally, historically speaking, it puts the economy into recession, or at least it correlates very strongly with future recession. We're gonna talk about wholesale inventory, other kind of inventories in the United States, and what that might mean for future economic activity next. Mm -hmm.